not naturally came. I'm not a very natural person either. Um, neither normal nor natural. Not that I'm anti natural. I feel like natural is terribly good with me. I'm good with that. Uh, this is Mr. Natural and yeah, Mr. Non Natural. All right, ladies and gentlemen, John D. Radiff, Michael Martinez, we move to the hand. Well, Welcome. Yeah. So John asked me to speak first, and uh, today we're going to talk a little bit more about dwarves. I'm trying to keep me on topic. Uh, <laughs> I had uh, wanted to talk a little bit about some, uh, I'm going to call them Egyptian parallels between dwarves and uh, Numenoreans. I would say that Tolkien, you got a good arm from it. I don't really want to say that Tolkien used or based the dwarves on Numenoreans. I mean, we talked a little bit about the, the good possible Hebrew. Uh, one of the characteristics of the Egyptian is that they were uh, considered probably uh, his, uh, some sort of a priestly function. And it did about how the Numenorean kings uh, had a priestly function, uh, starting with, I think, three times a year, procession up to the top of the highest mountain on this sort of. Uh, Sacrifice or recognition to the Uvatar and Gondor, at least. Uh, there is a the palace where Tolkien is going up there, probably doing space. Uh, he implied, I think, in a letter that the little space where Gandalf and Aaron walked down the was probably the actual. So, the, uh, the priestly role of the Numenorean and Gondor is, in Tolkien's words, not really uh, real evidence of the Middle Earth. And the only other uh, that I can think of are hymns that the elves uh, do the vow on. And they're hopefully functions that considered uh, holy acts or, or acts of worship or reverence. Among the dwarves, there was uh, there were two periods where the dwarves came together at a race. Um, yesterday I talked about how the dwarves were when they were created and according to the myth in the legendarium, uh Alway led them led, laid them in separate areas. And in one of his um, Secondary myths uh, being said that the dwarves came together with them in Al Gundabad. It served as their capital, and their civilization was basically established there and it flourished there. Eventually, the seven groups moved out and took possession of their ancestral homes or mansions. And from that time period, there was one dwarf who stood out and particularly uh, revered by all other dwarves, and that was Durin Atlas, who lived that he was considered to be virtually alive for a very long time. So the idea of immortality in an otherwise mortal race uh, is sometimes, uh, well, almost always in human mythology associated with God. The uh, other, only other occasion where dwarves came together in the histories that Tolkien like, was was distant descendant Thor was murdered by the orcs who had taken possession of Moria. And the seven orc families uh, assembled their armies and fought a combined uh, campaign against the orcs of the Misty Mountains. And they did this because of the insult that uh, had been uh, delivered upon the heir of Durin the Deathless, uh, Toby, the most uh, perceived king of the seven kings. And it was this sense of reverence that I think uh, provides one parallel between uh, and the Numenorean priest king, and ultimately the Egyptian. Uh, Arabs that both borrowed some symbology. I wouldn't want to take that, but I think it's a motif that Tolkien, uh, the three areas, dwarves and, and elves. The uh, the elf kings were also revered in a very special way. 
if you read this, you find occasional mention of princes who have no uh, connection to the Elven Kings. Glorfindel is one, uh, Endor is another, the Gilmer, uh, all the things. And Tolkien was probably using the term in a very traditional uh, medieval castle, that's, uh, in that the prince was sort of a group or a people uh, who did not have the ability or the legal to the king. The, there were only families who could escape among the elves. So the pharaohs of Egypt had several uh, prerogatives, princes amongst them, and they viewed other people as princes, I believe, no doubt they were foreign rulers, since they reserved the, the to themselves. So um, that's that's the only other point that they made that they did not get a chance to. I'll give John a chance to respond to that, and then Hawk wanted to uh, ask us a question as to the, the whole Dwarven Egyptian thing is really interesting. It never occurred to me before. The the, the uh, Egyptian Numenorean is pretty well documented. The illustration Tolkien made in his letter to Rona Bear drawing the Numenorean crown, very much like the northern southern Egypt. Uh, there's a little bit of Egyptian mythology in the Book of Lost Tales about the sun going through the underworld. It's very much like Ra's sun boat going through the Duat, being attacked by the giant serpent, being attacked by the giant spider. Uh, the dwarven part is completely new to me. So that's something I, that's really interesting. That's something I wanted to go away and kind of mull over the Egyptian dwarf. Um, the Egyptian, the, uh, the dwarven Hebrew part fascinated me ever since I heard Tolkien mention it in an interview. And I think he's very much drawn toward like the biblical Hebrews and also to the medieval. I don't remember if you touched on that yesterday or not. I started to. Started, but in, in Spain, in Iberia especially, there was a large Jewish community uh, protected by Muslim Spain during the time of the Moors. That they were renowned, they had suffered a dysphoria, they lost their homeland, they had a secret language but used the language of the people around them, they had a patriarchal tradition, but then so did most other people, and they were especially famous as craftsmen. That was one of the occupations that was open for the group of outsiders. And they also so were they, they were the great goldsmiths, the great whitesmiths, the great silversmiths. And they, they, uh, they also crossed lines. In Iberia, in what became Spain and Portugal, you found Jewish communities, both in the Christian lands and in the Moorish lands, uh, performing very similar functions. And uh, Tolkien sort of implies or leaves open the possibility that his dwarves are wandering around Middle Earth, uh, serving a similar function. One specific example is where uh, Thrawn and uh, Thorin are living in Dunland, and Dunland is considerably, uh, considered by most people to be a traditional enemy of Gondor and Rohan, and yet here the dwarves, uh, some of the exiles from the community, uh, where they're doing business with somebody. Maybe it was Tharbad, but why were they on the Dunland side of the river? So uh, I think that the, I think that the parallel of a medieval Jewish community uh, tends into that. makes that a lot of experience. sense. They're like the cathedral builders. They go wherever they're, they're expert craftsmen go from place to place, wherever the craft takes and wherever they're So that's, uh, that's a pretty interesting topic. Uh, I, I think that there will be some thoughts and interesting. So, Hawk, would you like to uh, have this uh, question that you wanted us to do? Okay. <clears throat> the, the question is were there any other sources for mithril or it's already processed mithril? A source of mithril. Anywhere in Tolkien's legendary of A. or Garda, besides Numenor. That's been the last couple days because I had not realized what powder keg it was. I posted a que that question a few days ago on three Tolkien lists: Merc list, you know, Nichols Endor list, and then the Tolkien list. Um, and 
There's been a little bit of discussion on the Endor list, a little bit of discussion on the Tolkien list, but the Mook list has been really active on this, and heatedly so. Um, a couple of people have been a bit passionate about the topic. Um, part of it is people making the premise that if it's not fun, then you can fill the blanks, whereas others say, no, it was phrased this way, that this is the, these are the only places that ever were, and there's a little arguing over was and is, as far as Moria was the only source of the only source country that can help set center. So a lot of interesting debate on that. We'd love to just hear your thoughts on four body sources of Middle, Middle Earth besides Moria and Middle Earth. Well, and, that's, and that was a that was a listener posted that question last night in, in Europe, and said it would be available live to see the recording later on. Without looking it up, just going off yeah, of yeah, summary. Yeah, just an opinion here. Gandalf speaks of Moria as being the the one place where Mithril comes from, and if you used past tense, I assume that would be because you can't get it. It was the one place you could get it, and now you can't get it anywhere. And I think Tolkien later said elsewhere it also had Mithril. But I think that's, I don't remember the chronology of it. That was more in the 60s. Yeah. Oh. So originally, I think he comes up with Mithril. You can only find it for Moria. And the tense is just, um, this is the one source of it. It was the place. Yeah. I wouldn't take that as meaning, now there are other places. I would I would take that as meaning, that was it, now you can't get it anywhere. But I could easily be overlooking a line of the letter, a footnote of the publication. How about you? Well, uh, first of all, myth had a history. I believe it started out in some of Tolkien's earlier works as a silver steel knoll. It could be for Again, I haven't done any recent research in this either. But there, uh, there was a special knell uh, that the dwarves or the knoll dwarf uh, made, which may, have, may or may not have similar to a special metal that I think uh, Yell or Yol may have made. Uh, the, the dark sword. Yeah, Tolkien might, might, might still introduce special metals. And Mithril became significant in the writing of the Lord of the Rings, so like the name first occurs in the Hobbit. Uh, there was a medal associated with the Atlantis legend. I don't know about the history of the Atlantis legend to know where it comes in, and I've been unable to... Or a Yeah, or a Calcum or a okay. or something like that. No, it's me trying after that in his uh, Numenor stories. Um, I, I feel like Loudon, uh, the character Loudon, might have made a reference to some sort of special medal. Um, but when he was doing the, the Notion Club papers, he had some really bizarre <laughs> concepts for what he was going to project onto Atlantis and Numenor. Um, so I would say, if you wanted a, a definitive answer based on the book that published, um, that a Moria or Bane is only going to be found, a, a Mithril or Bane is only going to be found in Moria. Uh, there would be other stories for Mithril, but the process refined mithril. Uh, I made a comment to Hawk last night that if uh, you look beyond the fall of Sauron, you would find the equivalent of a new vein of mithril ore in the ruins of the mountain which buried Jared in the because he had gathered all of the mithril that he could find, and presumably it was there in his fortress where he could protect it and do whatever he wanted to do with it. Once all that collapsed and the volcano erupted, cover all that stuff up, uh, you would have to mine it again, and perhaps it, it could have become mixed up with, with dirt and rock and become almost a, a natural vein. But the only officially designated determined vein that Tolkien played specifically in Middle Earth proper, as far as I know, was in Kazdu.
we read The Hobbit, we read The Lord of the Rings, and then we go read things like The Cimmerillion and The Book of Lost Tales and The Old Lays. Um, so for us, we think of the dwarves as being like the elves and the men and the hobbits, the ends, the people, one of the good guys. Everything Tolkien had written before he started The Hobbit, the dwarves were lumped with the orcs, with the trolls, with the giants, with the bad guys. Um, there's absolutely nothing I could find of a transition between the evil dwarves of the very early sibling stories and Thorin and company showing up to hire Bilbo. Um, and that just seems to be extraordinary. It's as if a group of orcs rode up to Bag Inn and said, we need you to get back a trick that we lost. <laughs> um, it's literally that startling in terms of the early Book of Lost Tales and other mythology. Yeah? Uh, you referred to someone really in uh, uh, about evil dwarves, right? Yes. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't in the early oh. versions of the Cimmerillion, oh. the, the versions that existed in the teens, the 20s, and the early 1930s, he started after he wrote The Hobbit to make the dwarves in the Cimmerian stories nicer. Um, he makes them less less mercenary, less bloodthirsty, less cruel. In the early versions, there's lots of dwarf and goblin armies working together to attack elven kingdoms. Um, orcs hiring dwarven mercenaries. Dwarves hiring orc mercenaries. Um, and you go all of a sudden from the dwarves sacking Dorian and killing Dingle to the dwarves showing up they get arrested by the Wood Elves who have an old quarrel. Yeah, it's a pretty big quarrel. Um, I, I, it fascinates me that he reinvented dwarves. Enormously successful. Made them very appealing, very very easy to relate to because they're not perfect. They're flawed good guys. But that was a brand new discovery, a brand new innovation in The Hobbit. It was something brand new in his stories. I can suggest a metaphor to explain why that might have happened. Uh, yesterday, um, someone asked me where I thought The Hobbit came from. And I suggested Tolkien, since he was trying to entertain his children, had checked himself into his story uh, through The Hobbit. So Bilbo is, in a way, Tolkien. Uh, the dwarves could be his children, Tolkien's uh, sons, sharing an adventure with their father, uh, more or less as equals. It's a way, it, it is actually a motif that uh, some fathers, at least, have uh, shared with their sons in terms of storytelling, uh, imaginary adventures, and things like that. And uh, that may just be how the story arose. Um, if you look at Rover Random, which is based on a little boy dog that uh, Tolkien's son Michael, is that the Michael. one? Michael. Lost at a beach, uh, J.R.R. Tolkien made up this whole story about how a wizard came by and enchanted the little toy dog and gave it a life and it went off and became uh, an adventurer. So, uh, in a way, Rover Random was Tolkien's son. And the people, the friends that Rover Random made uh, would probably represent his brothers, perhaps his father. Uh, maybe the man in the moon would have been J.R.R. Tolkien himself. I don't know. Michael does actually sort of appear in this because at one point Rover is reunited with the, the little boy, boy. Yeah, that owned him when he was yeah. a toy. And so, it, so know, who stayed yeah. with his family at the beach. So it's, the Tolkien's sort of appear as anonymous characters. In the Father Christmas fascinating. letters, yeah. yes. uh, they're addressed to the Tolkien children. So in a very real way, the Tolkien children are a part of the Father Christmas letter stories. These stories were, were not created for publication, mass uh, mass audiences, they were very private, personal stories between a father and his children. The Lord and of the Rings is the first one that's actually written for publication. The yeah. publisher knows about it. With Stark's book, he writes it specifically with the intent of submitting it. Everything else he does up on his own, out of his own fascination. Yeah, so this is, I, I think a lot of these, these stories Wonderful. are really about uh, Tolkien and his children. The mythology for England, the Book of Lost Tales, and the stories that came out of that, uh, were not intended for his children and his family. They were more his private musings uh, on a professional level. He wanted to explain uh, England's lost literature and mythology, or, or not explain it so much as... is recreated. Uh, you and Tom Shippey have called it an asterisk uh, mythology. The mythology that 
something to replace what was lost, something that yeah. could have been. So this abrupt transition that John is talking about in terms of the, the dwarves uh, as they move into Hobbit, I think that has a lot to do <coughs> with why, to, how Tolkien came up with these stories. Uh, one set of stories was intended for an English mature, thoughtful, intellectual audience, and the other set of stories was intended for Tolkien's family, in which they could share vicariously in some fun adventures. And they kind of meet and merge in the Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings. Yeah. Um, you know, dwarves show up a lot of St. Louis's books, too. He has both kinds of nasty ones and nice ones. Yeah, but there was yes. a synergy between the Narnia. Uh, there were a lot of borrowings. I had to say that because this is a father Christmas thing. <laughs> and the little <laughs> aliens in a Out of the Silent Planet, the, the third oh, yeah. intelligent race of Malachandra that only shows up briefly in The Great Craftsman, the Prifat. Perfect I, I can't I pronounce, can't pronounce <laughs> He uses an F's, an F's He has dwarfs rather than dwarves. But you're right, he has dwarfs throughout the Narnia. Dwarfs throughout the Narnia stories, and some of them go bad, and some of them stay good. Which probably goes back to the old horse light elves and dark elves. Did someone similarly, and wasn't there a point where dwarves the, the Mount Rebbe early on sacked one of the Elvish, was it, not Nargis, or one of the... Doria. 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 Yeah. yeah. They, they sacked it there because of the, the elves had something. I can't remember. They have, they have a big falling out over the Cimarron and the treasure that yeah, came so from they, Nargis. They, right, so they sacked that. Very complicated. Um, the death of Mim, the, the treasure from Nargathron, the the making of the Cimarron and the necklace of the dwarves. The necklace of the dwarves. And yeah. The dwarves of Belagost and Nograd come to Dorian, destroy Minogrom, kill the king, carry off the treasure. John actually goes on uh, at some length in was the, the history of the Hobbit about the, the treasures and the curses that are associated with them. And I'm looking it up and make a point of it because um, I, I had completely overlooked it in the past. You point out that a dwarf, an early dwarf, claims immunity. Yes. From, uh, from the dragon curse, or, or from the curse that's laid upon uh, the horde. Could you talk yeah. a little bit about that? Um, in the early versions of what became the Cimmerillion, there's the character of Mim. In the published Cimmerillion, Mim is the last of the petty dwarves. They're sort of outcast of the dwarven people. In the original story, Mim is much more like Durin. He's like the, the greatest of all the dwarf elders. Mim is killed by Hurin, Hurin's father who takes the treasure and takes it to Dorian, with Mim's curse on it. It's already under the dragon Gloron's curse. It is a complicated story. Mim says he has taken it partly because it came from his people, and partly because he is the only one immune to the dragon's curse. Because he's a dwarf, the dragon's curse cannot affect him, cannot affect the treasure within his keeping. Once he's killed, his curse becomes more important than the dragon curse. Paul said in another, the Elwing it actually dies because of Mim's curse on the treasure. Um, I believe that's Arendelle's wife, Elwing's mother. Um, in the version, she's changed into a seagull. She's not killed. But there's this enormous curse that comes from the dwarf who himself is immune to all other curses. That's very different from what the Hobbit wound up being. If in the original draft of the Hobbit, in the outline of the story ended, Thorin does not sickle the dragon curse. None dwarves do. That is a later development. Tolkien sketched out how the story was going to end, and then he stopped for about a year. And then he picked up writing again, and when he picked up writing again, he decided, no, I'm going to bring the curse into it. Thorin is going to change. He's going to succumb to the curse. He's going to behave unlike himself, irrational. That was not part of the original plan of the Hobbit. The original plan of the Hobbit, the curse did not affect the dwarves at all. So it's a, another of these complete reversals, just as bringing dwarves into the Hobbit in the first place reversed all of his early legendarium when he came to write the great climax of the Hobbit, all this complication between this claim on the treasure and this claim and 
this person being a good guy who's behaving badly. He decided to make the dwarves especially vulnerable to the curse. It's like the Arkenstone. Tolkien invents the Arkenstone so that Bilbo will have a 114th share of the treasure he can carry home with it. And then the Arkenstone keeps becoming more and more important until it becomes the one piece of treasure that the dwarves would never give up. So it's ironic. It's invented so there'll be a small portable piece for Bilbo to take away and have his fair share. It winds up being the one piece he's not allowed, that nobody's allowed to take. It's more valuable than Bilbo's mithril. Everything book. else. And so Tolkien will often come up with an idea and mull over it and think of it in terms of other contexts and wound up completely opposite significance of what he originally invented it for. He's just brilliant at seeing connections and ramifications and how this change will connect with this, which will connect with that, which will be much better than the original idea. And one of the all-time great revisers. I think I can expand on that a little bit. Yes. Um, having read your book and had some time to reflect on on the business of curses, uh, you, you made a point in the book that Bilbo was able to disrupt the process of the dragon curse as it was spreading uh, across everybody. And uh, it, he sort of cleansed the community and laid the curse to rest so that the dwarves and men and elves could live peacefully in the end. And you also just made the point that uh, Tolkien originally killed Elwing when the, uh, the, Nol the Feanorians came for the treasure. And then he changed his mind yes. and had one of the Valar, Omo, I believe, uh, transform her into a seagull. Yes, she's born up by the way. So there's another place in the, in the stories where uh, Tolkien implies very strongly that a divine intervention uh, prevents the the ultimate uh, preordained or, or not pre the the necessary fulfillment of the curse, and that's when Frodo and Gollum are struggling for the ring in, in uh, uh, Samoth Nower. Uh, Frodo has given up; he's caved in. The ring has, has spent months t tormenting him, and uh, he Frodo can no longer resist it, so he claims the ring for himself. Gollum, who's been poisoned by the ring for centuries, uh, now seizes upon Frodo, bites his finger off, and takes the ring, and he, you know, he's jumping up and down for joy, and dances right over into the fire, and just, you know, miraculously uh, destroys the one ring, freeing Frodo from the curse. Uh, because up until that point, everybody except Sauron, who had taken possession of the one ring, died. This is, uh, uh, an, an example of how Tolkien transformed traditional um, medieval curses. I guess, I guess there are curses in classical literature, but I think he was yeah. more more concerned with the the, the Fafnir uh, style curse. Yeah. Uh, so he transformed medieval curses into what were really expressions of very powerful wills. And uh, if you read the Children of Hurin, when Turin uh, confronts the dragon, uh, he uh, gives up too much of himself, and the dragon is able to use his his will, his magical power, to impose a curse on Turin. And this curse is also uh, a consequence of the curse that Morgoth the Dark had upon Turin. Turin was a great warrior. He went off to fight uh, Morgoth's forces in the battle of the near, near Nath, or, or Nadiad, I can't pronounce it, but uh, Turin was captured and uh, he was brought before Morgoth, and Morgoth tried to dominate him and was only partially successful. And Morgoth cursed him, and he said, you're going to sit here on my mountain, and you're going to see from afar everything that happens to your family, and you're going to know that I'm responsible for all of their misfortunes. So what Tolkien did was he put an explanation behind the power of the curse. The curse that's associated with the One Ring, of course, is the will of Sauron, part of which uh, resides in the ring. So Tolkien became very, uh, I think, sophisticated and consistent in using uh, the motif of, of a person who owns a treasure or something. Uh, ex ex exerting his will and influence uh, to control what happens around that, that, that artifact or something. Which... So it's always the mystery. Some of the items, how self-willed they are, how self-conscious they are. Some of them seem very passive at the similar
enormously positive to whoever touches them, whoever has them. But they're holy jewels. Yes, they're and not. some of them seem to very much have their own will, and to be willful and tricky, like the one ring that which is slips unnatural. off a finger, which is unnatural, which is unholy. The question to what degree is it a character, and to what degree is it a, just a tool, just an idol? He, he certainly blurred distinctions there um, very well. And he bore distinctions to go back, come back to the dwarves. He bore distinctions in the dwarves. Uh, there's always, almost always, in Tolkien's writing, some sort of division of dwarves. Um, back when they were more evil, the divisions, I guess, were more about greed and, and yeah. self-interest. Belagas versus no god. Uh, when when he transformed the dwarves uh, in the Hobbit, the the divisions there were not so clear. They were more of a personal nature. But you had Thorin and his survivors, and then you had his cousin Dane and, and their survivors, and supposedly there were other survivors. So the, the dwarves were not working together in a combined uh, community way. Uh, years later, after the writing of the, the Lord of the Rings, Tolkien guessed or concluded in a letter to somebody, I believe, or, or possibly a note, that some of the dwarves, the eastern groups, had probably fallen into evil by the end of the Third Age. So you come back to a division of the dwarves. You have good dwarves, redeemable dwarves, and you have dwarves who have fallen out of uh, uh, grace. And this is actually a biblical motif that uh, Tolkien would been, have been very much aware of. The uh, house of Israel, the people, the Hebrew people, according to their own prophets, will become divided into two groups. The one group, I believe, one third uh, who are saved, and two-thirds who are not saved in the final uh, battle. So I, I think that's in the book of Daniel, possibly in the not sure. Isaiah. It, it's been a while since I've read it, but it's a motif that's repeated over and over, like the division between the kingdom of Israel, the large kingdom of Israel and the small the kingdom of Judah, yeah. Israel being the one that falls into the evil, Judah being the one that survives much longer, even though it's smaller. Right, and that, that motif where uh, the community is divided into two parts, and the smaller part tends to be the one to survive. It doesn't just happen with the dwarves, it also happens with the Numenoreans. Most of the Numenoreans yes. become evil, and only a small group of them remain faithful, and those faithful go off to, to down to Arnor and, and Gondor. Uh, but then even in Gondor, you have the kin strife, where again, some of them fall into evil. So, um, Tolkien puts most of the division into his peoples, but you see it in the dwarf uh, more clearly, I think, than you see it in some of the other. Uh, uh, you don't always in the hobbits. You see it in the hobbits. You mentioned dark elves having a dark nature, but the way I understand it is, aren't they also known as more equinity, or elves that have seen the light of Balamor, but that they aren't evil per se? Yeah, the terminology is very, uh, very confusing and that you have the Avari, the unwilling to depart, you have the Mora Quinti, who's anyone who didn't go, the Cala Quinti, who's anyone who, who got, who did get there. Some of the Mora Quinti are not Avari because they set out, they just didn't go all the way. Uh, one person is insulted by being called Mora Quinti, uh, King Thingle, who went there and came back, and he's not actually Mora Quinti. By, by dark, the main definition is the dark elves are simply the elves who never went to Valinor. The elves who never saw the light of the trees. Uh, it's sometimes used a little more pejoratively as the more wild elves, the elves who didn't benefit from being with the Valar. But a lot of the Moriquiti are very impressive and really don't deserve that attitude, I think. And then there's the one or two dark elves like Eol. And it's not clear whether he literally is dark or whether he's sinister. And I think it more tends toward he's simply dark hearted dark nature. Who would you say was the most evil elf of all? Fanon, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> um. And which is, was one of the greatest surprises of those of us who had read Tolkien before the Cimmerian came out. But there are very few references to Feanor in the Cimmerillion, and they're all positive. In, in the Lord of the Rings. I'm sorry, in the Lord of the Rings. They're all positive that he had created the great, you know, he might even have created the Palantir himself. He created the gems. There are no references 
in The Lord of the Rings to how sinister his behavior was, to how much harm he did to his own people and others. And so The Lord of the Rings is just stunning to see what the elves have done in the past before the time of the story. It's another of those huge shifts in the way that he treated the dwarves. The way he treated the elves in The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings was very different. They are, they are much heightened, they are much better, they are more noble, Not as they're quite different than they were in the earlier stories. They've learned a few lessons. <laughs> <laughs> and it makes the point that though, you know, there are no more evil elves. That, you know, that's over. That happened uh, mm. at the at enormous cost. It's over. That yeah. any elves, that, the few elves that still survive, no better than to ever listen to Sauron again. The, yeah, the last vestige of elvish evil, as it were, would be the Rings of Power, which uh, <laughs> were really not natural things. They they subverted, subverted the natural order, and that's why they had to be destroyed. And the elves had come to realize this finally by the end of the, the Third Age. I think they somebody said it in the Council of Elrond, we understand what has to be done, and we're willing to make that sacrifice yeah. to give up all that we've accomplished, uh, because it has to be done. It's the right thing to do. And so they've been purged of that last sense of selfishness and self-interest and self-desire uh, that really ruined them again in the second age. And uh, so the third age really represents the final period of growth for the elves. Their story has to come to a close because they, uh, they're not going to suffer another fall. The dwarves, on the other hand, never really have a fall. Uh, not one that we see on stage, it's only implied in, in Tolkien's comment. And there's hope that the dwarves can come back for another period uh, in the fourth age. And uh, it's implied in the Lord of the Rings and, and explicitly stated in the notes that were prepared for the Lord of the Rings that they do actually take possession of Khazad Dum again and begin to uh, flourish as, as a civilization before finally uh, meeting their, their date, their destiny, their ultimate fate sometime late in the fourth age, I think. Uh, but they don't actually, the dwarves never really uh, sustain evil or fall into evil. They don't have one of these great spiritual divisions that afflict men and elves. And I think that they're, that's a very different radical departure from Tolkien's other themes. Would, would it be accurate to say that their theme, instead of falling into evil, is being driven out of their homelands repeatedly and having to keep through that process and sometimes we claim it and sometimes not. Well, in, in the Bible, the Hebrews are being punished history. for falling into evil, you know, according to the prophets. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, the, the dwarves, except for the fact that they, they do fight a few wars with many dwarves, <laughs> they seem like mostly good guys. And they're the ones who are always getting punished for what somebody else does. Yeah. Uh, so uh, they're kind of like the kicking boys of Middle Earth. <laughs> but there's a lot we don't know about them. Yeah, about the I, I think he could have developed a lot more about them. In another hundred years. Yeah, he, he certainly didn't make his dwarves roll over and just let somebody beat up on them. Uh, they never forgot, uh, you know, an offense committed against them. They were always out for revenge. So they had their flaws, but... Uh, uh, if Fenor hadn't have invaded or followed the area, uh, what would have happened to Orgon? Same thing? Good question. I think the Valar really didn't have a plan for him. In Tolkien's mind, I think that uh, the Valar understood that it was God who was arranging events. In each new age uh, of, of the universe timeline, God introduced things that the Valar, the angels, had not sung about in their original music. Well, it's hard to do the universe because of that. Well, he murdered his own people <laughs> because they would have given the ships to go over to them. And he abandoned his brother. He should have. They should have said, by all means, <laughs> <laughs> I think you're being facetious here. <laughs> I, I think that Bayar may have started out as a good guy, but he ended up as a bad guy. And he it was, yeah. Uh, but what would have happened if Feanor had not made it back to Middle-earth? Uh, I think that... Something else. Yeah, something else would have had to happen. God would have made sure of that. He didn't let Gandalf fail. But he made sure that he created the greatest of all the elves.
He let people make their own choice. Now you're getting in the free will. Here. So this is not this is not a bill with a philosophy um, yeah. presentation. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, does anybody have questions about dwarves? So we we have one. Um, it, it's well, oh, it's it's actually directed to Michael. Um, this is from Hallian in the Merck chat room. Okay. Um, I forget where he's at. I think he's sure. Probably correct me if I'm wrong on that. And he says, uh, what does Michael think about Radliff's ideas in the history of The Hobbit? The Hobbit was a part of Legendary from the beginning. Now, I think you talked about that a little bit yesterday, but... I actually, uh, on a blog that currently is not available, <laughs> uh, but I'm trying, hoping it'll be restored. When I first got the, uh, the, the books and I started to read this stuff, perhaps it was on the end list I said this, um, John's ideas have opened my eyes to some real new uh, possibilities. He has studied texts that uh, prior to now have not been revealed in any published source, and I'm not someone who has access to the unpublished at Marquette University. All of my research is based on the published books, and um, based only on what I had available up until uh, the history of The Hobbit was published, I felt that uh, The Hobbit was more just a a separate story that borrowed some stuff just because it was neat, cool stuff. Um, John uh, has introduced some ra revolutionary ideas, I'm going to say, that I think require some thought and consideration. I think there is some merit uh, at some level to what he's saying, and I may find myself a champion of uh, some of the ideas that he's put forward. Um, I think it would be better if John talk a little more openly about some of these uh, thank connections. You, thank you very much. Um, basically, I, I emphasize this partly because there was unpublished evidence which supported the case, and partly because I thought the case had been understated. Um, whether or not The Hobbit was created to be part of the Legendarium, or whether it was later became part of the Legendarium after it was completed, really depends on how you define the Cimmerian, how you define Middle Earth, how you define the Legendarium. Since the case that it was extraneous, that it was autonomous, that it really wasn't part of it, had been made so well and so strongly, I felt that someone really needed to present the other case to pull the evidence together to say, there are two pretty equal ways of doing this. So I deliberately stressed it. I did become more and more convinced of it over time, because once I started looking at it from that point of view, more and more things seemed to get in place. Um, I think it's a debatable point to what degree The Hobbit was created as part of the legendary. Um, I come down on the side of it was, definitely. It, it draws directly on the Cimmerian from the very first draft of the very first chapter. Um, whether or not that makes it part of the legendarium depends on how you define the legendarium. Uh, Roverandum draws on the Cimmerian at one point, and it's certainly not part of the Cimmerian. There's just so many elements. I think one thing that convinced me, after I was well into the project, I realized almost everybody that Bilbo and the dwarves came up against and opposed had appeared in the Cimmerian as one of the peoples, one of the races created by Morgoth. I called them the children of Morgoth. The only exception were the spiders, who were the children of Ungoliath. That the hobbits and dwarves never run across an enemy that isn't already created through the Cimmerian. And almost all of the allies that they run into had also appeared in the Cimmerian. That made me think it was the same world, even if it was in flux, even if things were important. Let me ask. A but question. I think it's debatable. I think you can make a good case either way. We've got some. We've got some young people in the room, but uh, some of the older people might remember this. How many of you read a book about King David of the Hebrews? Anybody? Okay, so I, I see a few hands. Was the book very big? Was it like an encyclopedia type serious history book? It was just something that you know was interesting for for a, a kid or something like that. We teach history at many different levels in our society. We have very deep scholarly arguments that put most people to sleep, perhaps even the people who write them. And then we have you know just you know very briefly written books that just outline the facts of, of a person's life or or the details of a war. Even newspapers do this. Uh, they may put just a little bit of a feature article here. They may do a series of articles that explain things. Yeah. And um, 
one one application that we could uh, bring to this debate is did Tolkien take the Silmarillion mythology and reinvent it as a children's story and basically just uh, extract from the older stories enough information to recreate that world in a way that his kids could enjoy it without getting all wrapped up in the phil the phil uh, language. I have, I'm terrible to pronounce these words, but the, the old mythologies had a lot to do with language and how it evolved and certain Catholic themes and, and religious ideas. And that's not really uh, very interesting stuff for, for kids' stories. I think that he just wanted an adventure story, but he wanted to put it in uh, a very familiar context for himself. Um, can I prove that? No. <laughs> as important as the languages are, there's not a lot of it in The Hobbit. You know, there are the characters' names, but there's none of the elaboration of the Cimmerian of, you know, Turin, the son of Huron, who was called Turanbar, who was also the Mormigil, who was on these long list of alternate names, family names. Obviously, like, this is Bladorth. Now, this is Bard. You find out later on that Bard has some connection to Gimli. It's yeah, just, it's, it's uh, very simple. Thorin. Thorin, Oak, and Thorin, son of Thorin, son of Thorin, son of Thorin, or perhaps yeah. Thor, son of Thor. <coughs> Thorin. It's not a, it's not, it's not a very detailed uh, title list or anything. Just as much as you need. You're, you know, it's like here I am. I'm Michael. I need a burglar. Uh, you're it. <laughs> Let's go off and get a dragon horde, Okay. Yeah. So not the Michael. Not not the Michael, but I am Michael. Well, he was actually the Thor. The. He was the Thorin. He was both those. Uh, so I, I think that uh, at some level, maybe Tolkien was just simply recreating a Silmarillion-like world that his sons could relate to. We've got a question here. Um, uh, four wise, um, isn't four the, uh, like a Norse mythology? Um, um, Thor, Thor was the god of thunder. I, I was talking about the Thorin. I, and, I know yeah. Thorin. Oh, okay. So you don't relate that at all to that mythology? Um, I don't know that he uses the name, he doesn't use the name Thor or the name Odin, but it's the same language and Thor sometimes works in some of the names. There are dwarven names that would include that as an element. Yeah. Um, I think he deliberately omitted a direct connection to Thor, uh, not so deliberately uh, with Odin being the chief of the gods. You could say that Manwe being the, the chief of the Valar, there is... Uh, some sort, and they're both, Odin is a sky god. The, in one of his letters, uh, Tolkien uh, talks about how a lot of mythologies around the Mediterranean and, and European landscapes have a chief god uh, who has something to do with air and wind or something like that. And I think it's it's very significant that the leader of his valor is named Man Wei and, and is called uh, uh, Blessed One. But he, his connection, his association is with air. And uh, I think, therefore, that Man Wei has a, a, a sort of direct deliver connection to Odin. But I don't really know of anybody, perhaps Tolkus in the Silmarillion, uh, is as close to Thor as, as you're going to get. Tolkus liked to fight. Thor liked to fight. Tolkus really didn't want to uh, sit and figure out all the complexities of the moral issues. You know, he saw that Morgoth needed to be captured, and he just wanted to get him. And, and Thor pretty much just went around the landscape killing giants and uh, <coughs> having fun. So. And, and the Valar are, are uh, an unusual lot. They, I don't think they're based directly on the gods of Norse mythology. They're, they're a bit closer to the Roman gods in the very first draft of the story. Then they, so Manwe and Zeus is a good pair. And then there is some Norse overlay, and then there's some Celtic overlay, and then there's a little bit of Egyptian overlay, and then there's... It gets very complicated the way he draws on sources. Uh, he does say once in an interview, he said, I could never create a mythology that had Thor and Odin in it. Um, so he doesn't mean them to be literally directly in it, but he can certainly be inspired by them. He can certainly have a god who does in his world what Thor would do in the Norse mythology. Yeah. And I think Tolkis is the closest of the the big, strong, dumb, good guy that you can always rely on. Thor was considered the champion of men in Norse uh, and in Germanic mythology. He was considered to be one of the better gods. He was the most popular. Yeah. The whole, all Very popular. Gods. 
Um, and even in modern literature, Thor is usually treated uh, very uh, favorably. He's usually a hero or a, a friend of heroes in stories in modern fantasy. Uh, in the comic books, The, the Mighty Thor, uh, I loved that comic when I was a kid growing up. And he's always a good guy. And, um, just, uh, I think most people see Thor, the Thor figure, as a really good guy. Tolkien, Tolkien is a good guy. He still has one of the days of the week named after Thursday. <laughs> yeah. The old pronunciation was Thursday. It's Thursday. You know, Wednesday was Wilkins Day. Tuesday was Tears Day. Friday was Phrase Day. Thursday is the only one that we can still recognize. The name is almost the same pronunciation. Yeah. It's changing the O to a U after a thousand years. So first of all, Hallian is in Finland. We've got another Artemir. Says he'd like to point out that he thinks Gandalf has some Odinic characteristics himself. And I had a question, what about, was it Orme who rode around with his horn and on the horse that, with the elves and everything? Kind well, of, yeah, I, I think the Odinic connection uh, with Gandalf has been documented pretty well yeah. in, in the literature. Uh, very much so. Um, um, especially yeah. a very good book by Marjorie Burns that came out called Perilous Realms that looks specifically at Tolkien's borrowing from Norse mythology and from Celtic mythology. The way that they're parallel, the way they're played off against each other. I think she might devote a whole chapter to ways Odin, bad stories about Odin are applied to Sauron. And you know, the, the staring eye, the evil necromancer. So all the bad stories about Odin, Tolkien used for a villain. All the good stories about Odin, Tolkien used for yeah. Gandalf. Yeah. Um, I, I kind of fascinated think, yeah. the way he split things up and divided them out. Yeah. I can't think of any uh, critics that I've read who have talked about Gandalf without at least mentioning Odin in <laughs> passing. It's almost a rite of passage. You're not accepted if you don't say something like that. But uh, it, it, I think it is a very strong theme in, in Gandalf's character. For me, um, I've always associated him with the wild hunt. I don't know why. Uh, it's not really, there's no real solid connection there except that he's just like a, a sort of a loose cannon rolling around the deck there. And he just goes out and does whatever he wants. And uh, John actually uh, provides a pretty solid history of the Wild Hunt in the history of the Hobbit. Uh, and he mentions a king. I've read the story before. I forget the king's name. Uh, that Herda. Herda. He goes to Herda. Fairyland and uh, comes back. He's accompanied by some knights or somebody. And as soon as some, one of his men steps off his horse, when they're back in mortal lands, uh, they've been gone for about 200 years, the man just turns to dust. And so the king and the, the, his followers realize that they can never get off their horses. So they just ride around the landscape for a while, and or the, they become the wild hunt, or, or a version of the wild hunt. People for centuries talk about seeing King Perla and the wild hunt run by. So uh, I, that's pretty much what I think of more of anything. What is the origin of the Lord's Grace? And if it's related to twist being, the, being a twisted elf, would that make orcs the most evil elves? Do we get to talk about Beowulf in answering that question? Whatever you want. Grendel is considered one of the children of Cain, I believe, or something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. Uh, Cain being a man who became corrupt. So, uh, at one point, Tolkien, the Tolkien uh, implied or stated that the orcs were probably descended from corrupt elves. I think orcs are Grendels, to be honest. I think that's where they came from. Whether he stayed with that throughout his life is another issue. But I think that, that orcs are, are part of the race of Grendel. There's a, a wonderful section, I think it's called Myths Transformed, where Tolkien wrote a series of essays about where do orcs come from. That the old, the original story seems to have been that they were elves that were captured by Morgoth and destroyed and corrupted and made evil. Later he decided, no, that they were men. And then at one point he said, you know, they might just be animals. They might be creatures that have been bred into human shape that are animated by Morgoth. And if you remember the, in the Lord of the Rings, when Sauron is destroyed, all of the enemies sort of wander around like insects, he says. Uh, the idea that they're, they're not really sentient, they're not really intelligent, they don't actually have a purpose and a personality of their own.
But these things really aren't prioritized of which is, the, which is authoritative, which is final. There are all these different ideas that he's tossing out. Um, but the only thing and they might all be true. It, he might have started by corrupting elves and later corrupted men. Because there's different types of work. Because there are different types of work. They don't all have to come from a single origin. Yeah. The only idea that he that he retained throughout all of that is that the orcs appear to be a corruption of something else. Uh, that they're not created, um, I, I forget what the yeah. word is, as themselves. Uh, they, they came from something else. In whatever state of, of this thought, uh, the orcs are always brought forward through corruption from something, some other form. One of the uh, more unusual theories I heard a year ago, Daryl Martin maintains that the orcs were undead, that they were zombies, that they were living bodies that the souls had been destroyed out of. So just as you had, you, know, you have a body and an animating spirit, and he thought it was possible for Morgoth to destroy the animated spirit but leave the body alive. And that this would explain why the elves never took prisoners, why they destroyed every orc. That they were like living zombies. They were an abomination. Um, that's, that's, I've never seen that theory elsewhere. It's ingenious in that it solves so many problems. There's yeah, just not any authoritative... It, it relies part. upon the absence of denial as proof. Tolkien never said they weren't zombies. Yes, <laughs> but so he, never, they he never says they are. I so you, it's not an authoritative explanation. It's an explanation someone came up with, which actually explains a lot of the facts, but it doesn't have an authority behind yeah, it. Through the years, I've called that the Uzi rule. Uh, Tolkien never said that orcs don't carry Uzi submachine guns, so therefore they probably did. We just didn't see them in the stories. Uh, that, that's where a lot of those arguments uh, end up. So you were showing me three fingers? That's three more sta uh, question statements in the chat room here. Okay. Um, question from Ardemir. Uh, he's asking if, uh, if Rattler might mention, if he mentioned, he's asking if he mentions it in the history of the Hobbit or not, but do you have any theories about who King Gladderthan is? Oh, who he is? King Gladderthan? Yeah, we know who, yeah. the name. Uh, he, it's mentioned that you know, they were made for his armory and that he's long dead. So he was some great king of men who had a Sindarin name, or what the early form of the language that became Sindarin. There doesn't seem to be much doubt that he was human. Yeah. Uh, he was alive at the time of the Lonely Mountain, and he was dead by the time of Thorin's return, all those, what is it, about 200 years later? Other than that, we don't know what his kingdom was, we don't know where it was, we don't know anything about him. It's part of the undefined part of the Hobbit. You know, in, in the Hobbit they get things from Dorwinian, they get wine from Dorwinian. We don't know where Dorwinian is at that point. Well, um, I was going to say that most Tolkien scholars that I've read uh, do agree that uh, the name is probably Sindarin, Vlad uh, in Thin being attested Sindarin elements that that work together with the name John explains. I think Douglas Anderson may also have uh, put something into the annotated Hobbit. Uh, some years ago, someone who either is in Germany or speaks German suggested to me that it, the name could be from Old English Blad and Earthen. Uh, he said that Blad meant renowned and Earthen meant the earth uh, or the world. And since that was originally the name of the wizard, uh, that it could mean that he was a very world famous wizard. It's not an article, uh, an argument that is supported by anything in Tolkien's writings of which I'm aware. But if, but if we assume for the sake of discussion that that's a reasonable meaning, even if it wasn't the original intended meaning, um, if you then transfer the name to a man, I think Douglas Anderson does say that it's kind of unusual that a, a non-Numenorean man would have a, an Elvish name. Uh, no. But that would be consistent with the Germanic names that Tolkien was using uh, for men in that area. So I think you just answered you know, the question Arthur has, is, isn't it possible if Latterton was an elf? And then we just, uh, just tied that right in. Well, uh, I don't remember the exact phrase in The Hobbit. It was certainly my impression that he was human. He had uh, three-pointed spears, I think, or something like that, tritons or something. Uh, I, I don't remember exactly, but he's dead. Uh, there are no mentions of great elf kingdoms coming to an end, so 
Um, um, I should point out, just you, know, you mentioned it in passing, that Bladorthan is originally the name of the character that's known as Gandalf in the published book. That Tolkien wrote the story, the wizard that accompanied Bilbo and the others is Bladorthan. Um, he uses that name all the way up to when they arrive at the Lonely Mountain. And then he goes back and changes the character's name to Gandalf. And then a chapter or so later, you know, they're in the Horde, they find the weapons that had been made for the great king Bladorthan. So he's reusing a name, he's shifting it from a wizard name to a king's name. But he never tells us anything about the king except that one line. Yeah. So I know, John, you're getting tight on time here, right? Hello. I am yeah, too. Yeah, so, okay, you are too. Okay, so let's just fire a few of these off real quick. To sure. Help our international community here. <laughs> um, so you mentioned Dorwinian, so that ties in nicely. Do you, he just asked point blank, do you think Dorwinian is Elvish or Manish? John. The name or the place? The place. Um, I think it's probably Manish just because there aren't that many Elvish kingdoms around, but that's a guess. Originally, Dorwinia is a place in Valinor in the very early stories. Then it becomes a place mentioned in the stories of Valerian. Then it becomes a place mentioned in The Hobbit. Right, um, and then he puts it on the map in The Lord of the Rings. Um, my guess is human, but the name could be human or Elvish. Uh, it depends on which way the coin toss comes up for me. So I, I've changed my mind on that one many times. I don't really know. Okay. Uh, different, any difference between orcs and goblins, and why did Tolkien switch from orc to goblin? There is no difference between orcs and goblins. He uses both names in The Hobbit, and he uses both names in The Lord of the Rings. Um, in The Hobbit, I think he only uses orc as the narrative voice. I'm not entirely positive. I, I did look it up one time because that's a that was a strong argument. In The Lord of the Rings, he mostly uses goblin uh, in the voices of the hobbits, and the hobbits only seem to speak, say, orc when they get around more sophisticated, more ancient cultures. Uh, but I think, I, I don't know what his real thinking on that was. He tended to use orc more in the old material, the early Book of Lost Tales, the Lays of Valerian. The hobbit switched to goblin and only mentions orc a time or two. The Lord of the Rings mixes them. The puppets tend to call them goblins, and the other characters often call them orcs. But keep in mind that uh, one of his influences was William Morris. And again, The Hobbit was originally a story that he created for his children. Uh, and I think they would have been familiar with goblin, whereas orc would have sounded very... Uh, the Princess and the Goblins by yeah. Donald. And the Princess and with Kirk. Donald, not Morris, yeah. So um, I, I think that uh, goblin is very naturally uh, associated with hobbit, stuff simply because uh, it was something that the kids were familiar with. Okay, last two questions and then we'll wrap it up. Um, and, and this next one, I know you could probably go on for a very long time, but in the interest of, because I'd love to have you do it all day. Um, could you say just a few words about, he says, the 1960 Hobbit. I'm not, I'm not That's aware a of question for John to answer. Okay. okay. Um, Tolkien wrote The Hobbit around 1930-32, published it in 1937. When he was writing The Lord of the Rings, he decided he needed to change the Gollum story in The Hobbit. So he rewrote that. That was published in the early 50s as a second edition. Long about 1960, he decided it would be better to rewrite the whole Hobbit in the style of The Lord of the Rings. And so he set out revising it very heavily, adding some new bits, changing the characters some. Um, he got as far as the character's arrival in Rivendell when he abandoned it. So the 1960 Hobbit is only a little more than two chapters long. Uh, it's fascinating stuff. It had never been published until Christopher Tolkien read from it at a conference in 1987, and I got to publish it in the second volume of the book. Um, I like it very much, but it's very different from The Hobbit. It's much more like the appendices of Lord of the Rings, much more like the little piece called The Quest for Erebor. I don't know if you have anything to add on. Dude, I'm still running for me. <laughs> it's, um, it's something Tolkien started out a complete rewriting, redrafting of The Hobbit, but he didn't get very far into it, and 1960 Hobbit was the sort of the tagline part. It would have been the third edition of The Hobbit if he had finished it. Okay, the last one to help wrap things up um, is for both of you. Are you on, you're working on any Tolkien related? current projects or have any, that would be a huge list, any near projects you think upcoming? Start with uh, John here. 
Michael, you and I talked about a couple, so we might tie that together. So, John? Well, I had you fun writing my, writing my piece here for about Tolkien role-playing games, because while a lot of that was known, it was scattered around, I didn't think it had been pulled together in one place. Um, actually, I'm writing a piece about Tolkien's writer's block, and the way that it shaped what we got. That we got, Tolkien finished some things, very prolific writer, but didn't finish a lot of things. And the way that this shaped what he wrote, and how he wrote it, and how it came out. Um, it's a big topic, so obviously I'm still trying to wrestle it into shape. But I think it's interesting because it shows us things about us from shows us things about him from a different perspective. Well, um, a fair number of people know that uh, in the 1990s I started to write a history book based on all the historical notes uh, that Tolkien made about the, the various peoples and, and countries of Middle Earth, and um, Wayne Hammond took a look at the, the manuscript and he suggested that it probably did not have enough scholarly uh, commentary and annotation in it. Uh, since then, I showed that book to somebody else uh, who had worked uh, as a what's called a book packager with people like Dean Koontz and uh, Stephen King. And he proposed a very uh, graphical uh, Middle Earth history book. Uh, he put together a package with me and, and a very well-known Tolkien artist that uh, I don't really, I'm not really at liberty to, to discuss his name. Uh, they sent a proposal to the Tolkien estate. And as far as I know, that proposal has never been formally rejected, but uh, has never been accepted. Uh, this was several years ago. So I've still got my notes, and I've been thinking for the past month or two that if I could set aside some time later this year, or early next year, I could probably rewrite that history book, not as a graphic, visual uh, history book, but as a somewhat more scholarly work, with the commentary and annotation that Wayne Hammond felt would make it uh, a justifiable, independent work that didn't need to be reviewed by the Tolkien estate. Um, so. If I do that, it'll take about a year to write it, and then I'll have to decide whether I want to self-publish it, which I've only self-published one book, and it's been very successful as a self-published book, uh, or whether I want to give it away as a free ebook. I feel like with more than a million downloads, I could have made some money off of Parma and Dorian, um, or if I want to send it to a publisher. So uh, I think I will take a stab at trying to rewrite the history. In, in, as more of a commentary, and uh, we'll just have to see where I end up over the next year. And then Hawk, you and I had talked about, and of course I've been sick lately, so we weren't able to, to follow through yet, but uh, we're talking about doing a uh, weekly internet radio broadcast about Tolkien and Noah, uh, and having some guests uh, uh, that we can talk to. So that's really all I've got in the works right now. Right. Uh, Artemir just commented just as far as the uh, 1960 Hobbit. He said he'd like to point out to Michael that there's more info about the Forgotten Inn in 1960 Hobbit since he knows that you have been involved in discussions about the Forsaken Inn. Sorry, Forsaken Inn. Forsaken Inn, yeah. yeah. Um, it's, it's mentioned. Yeah. <laughs> they stop at the last inn and it notes that by the time of the Lord of the Rings it was called the Forsaken Inn. And then we get into the issues of canon and what's okay. authoritative and things okay. like that. So that's, that's going to have to wait for me to mull over. Right. <laughs> he, he, there was going to be a t he started writing a timeline for The Hobbit, just like the one in the back of The Lord of the Rings where you could trace day by day where they were and what they were doing, but he didn't get the whole, didn't get the whole story. Did as far as the Middle Earth Radio, that's, there's also talked about tying in with TolkienScholars.com, that's what an S at the end, not the about the S, about doing uh, maybe monthly initially, but basically almost in, in, in and this is tricky, and we're going to have to work out all the ramifications, but this is something brewing. Basically, an online Tolkien University where um, knowledgeable Tolkien scholars such as yourself come on and teach a course that day through internet broadcasting, like we're doing right now, in interactive fashion, to a course of, you know, of students, basically, on a particular topic. And, um, and make it interactive that way rather than just like a one way broadcast. As the, as the radio one could be where we have guests and things like that. So that's something else that's brewing. I've talked to 
Chris Seaman and a number of others, as well as John Pugh. And down the road, we'll see if that happens. But that's just some other. I think there are enough people to make it feasible. I think so. Yeah. What's that? I think there are enough people with expertise so in all far, different about fields a people that, have said yes. that it's feasible. Just from the point of there's a lot of people who know. There's a lot of Tolkien to specialize in, and there are a lot of people that know a lot about specific parts of it. Yeah. That sounds very doable. Yeah. So that's something brewing as well. Okay. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank well, you very much. Thank you so much for coming. It's been and thank pleasure. you for the people sending in questions. Yeah, thank you, everybody around the world. <laughs> thank you, John and Michael. Thank you. Thank you.